Hi, everyone. I am Jennifer Hancock, and I'm a board member for the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. And this is our first meeting for the emotion intelli emotional intelligence subgroup of the Humanistic Management Association. Um, we have a lot of people in our group that come from either psychology backgrounds or emotional intelligence backgrounds or sociology backgrounds or behavioral backgrounds that work in the field of humanistic management. And so we decided it was time to create a subgroup. And so several of us have been having conversations, uh, informal meetings. And at some point, Oren came, started talking to us about hypnosis. And all of us went, ooh, we want to hear more about that. And so we asked him to do a, a more formal presentation for us. And so that's how this came about. Um, if you're interested in joining the subgroup, um, we're going to start posting the meetings like this on the Eventbrite. So you'll be able to join us for those conversations. We don't really have a strict format yet, um, but this one is a presentation because all of us decided we wanted to learn more from Oren. So let me introduce Oren so you know why we wanted to learn from him. Oren Davis uh, earned his first doctorate, and yes, he has more than one, in positive psychology and is a self-actualization engineer who enables people to do and be their best. He consults for companies from startups to multinationals on hiring strategies, culture, innovation, diversity, equity, inclusion, and employee well-being, and coaches people at all levels of building self-knowledge and developing personal growth trajectories. As the principal investigator of the Quality of Life Laboratory, he conducts research on flow, creativity, hypnosis, and mentoring. Dr. Davis also serves as a professor of creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, business, and psychology, and gives workshops and lectures globally about human capital, creativity, innovation, and positive psychology. He's also a startup advisor who helps early stage companies enhance their value propositions, pitches, culture, and human capital, and writes and speaks avidly about human capital, creativity, innovation, and positive psychology and there you go so Oren, welcome and thanks for agreeing to do this for us um as i said for everybody else who's watching when Oren started talking about this in our meeting last time which was a closed meeting uh we all got very excited so i and I, clearly this is resonating because so many people registered to participate um, so welcome and please talk to us about empowering people through hypnosis Thank you. Very excited to be here. I'm going to add one update to my bio. Uh, I do have only one doctorate. I, I woke up oh. I was thinking about two, but I got the first doctorate in positive psychology. So it was the first doctorate ever awarded in the field, uh, which I did under uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. So do work. So that's where all the flow research comes in. I've uh, been a hypnotist long before, uh, very passionate about the subject. Uh, as I warned Jen, I can talk about this all day. It's something I really love. So uh, what I thought I would do is I thought I would go through some of the myths and just start debunking some of the mythology that's out there. And then I thought I would follow up just talking about what hypnosis is. Now, I know we have a very wide audience. So in some cases, I'm going to mention some of the research or the researchers. Uh, people are welcome to look this stuff up. Um, there are There is a lot of technical research that goes into hypnosis, and there's a lot of the technical side to it. So... Uh, there's, there's a lot to dive into here. I'll do my best to take questions, cover everything. But um, I, what I really want to encourage people to do is dig into this uh, so much more because I think that there are a lot of possibilities. So, you know, just going through the problem, the, the biggest thing is there are a lot of misconceptions about hypnosis out there. And, you know, if you haven't really studied psychology or if you haven't really worked with a practitioner, unfortunately, you're probably exposed to a lot more misconceptions than truth. This is, this is annoying um, for a lot of us who are in the field because it makes it harder for us to do hypnosis. Now, for those who are in the United States, I do want to point out that the USA is one of the only countries in the world where hypnosis is not regulated. In most developed countries, it's not so easy to just hang up a shingle or go out and start hypnotizing people, and that is a good thing. Um, not so much that because people could really do harm, so much as it really does... Uh, help to make sure that you that the practitioner that you're working with is well trained and properly trained. But I mean, where do where did we get all these all, all these nonsense ideas from? Well, let's let's start with the literature, going all the way back to uh, Du Maurier's book Trilby T R I L B Y. Um, Trilby was a book that uh, talked about a hypnotist uh, controlling a young woman, and that really got some ideas going. 
that's a pretty old book. And a lot of the ideas and the, the dramatizations of hypnosis actually started uh, back there. We also have children's television, uh, Looney Tunes, Pokemon. It's all over children's media. So you know, like, we're starting by training kids in these really messed up ideas of what hypnosis is and what it's about. And this idea that you can actually get out there and control people. But don't worry, because we have folks like Darren Brown uh, showing mentalism tricks on uh, adult television. And while I do want to point out that Darren Brown, and, and I do want to concede this point on Darren Brown, he is actually quite talented. He's very good. He knows what he's doing. Uh, but there are some tricks to his trade also. And that goes along with stage hypnosis. So there's a lot of stage hypnosis out there. We use, we use hypnosis as comedy and a uh, fair warning uh, just to let everybody know that there are going to be spoilers i'm about to ruin stage hypnosis for you so if you do if you want to be able to enjoy stage hypnosis in the same way that you used to now's a great time to leave because i'm going to spoil it all and i'm also going to spoil darren brown to a degree but I, because i'm a fan of darren brown i really am um i'm going to leave you guys some mystery on what he does so let me explain, you know, the, some of the common sense explanations. One of the biggest reasons that the, um, that the myths of hypnosis persist is we really don't bother. We, you know, we have better things to do to take the time to sit and think this through and actually debunk what's going on. It's, uh, uh, you know, when, when you stop to think about it, uh, what, we, what we think about hypnosis, these myths, they really don't make sense. So I'm going to explain this in a few different ways. And the first is um, there are, a lot of it is based on appearances. So the myth that you're seeing, that's definitely how it looks, but you're missing the other explanations. The second form of explanation, especially when it comes to the entertainment industry, is that if we is that if hypnosis were the way that it actually, if hypnosis were in the media, the way it actually is in real life, this would be kind of dumb. And the other thing is people don't really consider these myths at scale. Like what, what if it just you know, really worked that way, this, this wouldn't go very well at scale. So let me, let me give you my, my first uh, most amusing version uh, uh, myth, the magic pocket watch. That, you know, when you watch the media, the hypnotist has this shiny object. It is often a pocket watch. And instantly the person becomes completely riveted to the watch and they get hypnotized. They can't look away. There's that we have versions of this with uh, crystal balls vortices, flashing colors. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, this is also crazy. What, what are we talking about? Now, okay, first of all, it, where, where does this come from? So let, let's back up. Let, let's just take a look at the science of this for a second. Um, we're all in a virtual Zoom, so this is a little bit harder to do, especially because I have to use a fake background. But if you and I were in person, and I were to take a flashlight, hold it up, and then just go like that with it while it's lit, your eye is gonna be drawn to that right away. The eye follows the bright object, the eye follows the moving object. Uh, this is actually important for us evolutionary, you know, from, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, imagine like in, uh, you know, ye old times, uh, hunting in the jungle, you see movement out of the corner of your eye, you definitely wanna take a look at that because if you don't, you might be dead. So we are, so as soon as, so, I mean, just for example, if you, I want everybody to just take a good look at me on the screen. Everybody try to take a good look right here at my face and my nose. Now watch what happens when I do this, right? You see moving up here. Now all of a sudden you start looking at that corner of my screen. We, we follow moving objects and that's where uh, the value of the vortex, the pocket watch, that's where it comes in. We're taking advantage of how the brain naturally works to help focus attention. So we're able, we are able to use these mechanisms to help people get attentive or to help people focus because a lot of people do get a challenge, do find a challenge when they want to focus. So, you know, not for nothing, there is value to that. And that, that's why many hypnotists will use what's called the eye fixation induction. The technical term for it is eye fixation induction. We're having people focus on this. Oh, and by the way, sneaky little stunt that we're doing. Uh, everybody misses the little detail about that little pocket watch thing. And, I, and for those of you who want to try this, I just want to show you something. I want you to take your finger, hold it right up at eye level for a minute. Okay, now what I want you to do is now take the, now I want you to look at the tip of your finger. Now what I want you to do is move your finger about one, two inches upward. Keep looking at the tip of your finger. What you probably notice is now this is causing eye strain. 
And of course, if you keep doing that, your eyes are going to get tired. As a matter of fact, they're going to get heavy. Anybody see where this is going? Yeah, that is a great little trick. And so, you know, what's really funny about this is when we're doing this, we usually hold the object slightly above eye level to induce eye strain. So when we tell them that their eyes are getting heavy, what they don't realize is, of course, their eyes are getting heavy. They're going to get heavy anyway. This, this is one of the dirty little hypnotist tricks that we use is that, you know, actually, if you just hold something above eye level and just keep looking at it, I promise your eyes are going to get heavy because uh, it's actually hard to do. So now what, what helps is because we're doing that, because we're helping people to focus and we're hopeful and a, a, a trained hypnotist is going to time that comment as they start to notice the participant's eyes getting heavy. And so, you know, basically we're using contiguity theory. We're, we're basically creating the contiguity of the statement that the person's eyes are getting heavy with the fact that their eyes are in fact starting to get heavy and they would anyway. And because of the context that we've created, they start to believe that our comments are helping to facilitate that process. And then they actually start to. So this is, this is part of how we're doing that. And by the way, again, when we're using this for positive purposes, that is the idea. We're hoping to build that connection and to facilitate that suggestive rapport. But I also do want to point out that unlike on in the media, it doesn't come from nowhere. It actually comes with something, you know, a lot more realistic. But, you know, along those lines, what I want to point out is that what hypnotists really do, we help people to focus when it may be hard for them to do it themselves. But I really want you to get, and, and it's a point I'm going to return to a whole bunch of times, but think about this, that as hypnotists, we're facilitating the focus of others. And as, you know, and, and was, as we translate this idea to the workplace, I want to point out that one of the primary roles of managers and leaders is to help people focus, right? Leaders, they provide vision. Managers provide coordination. So if you think about the chaotic workplace of today, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not just talking about like the VUCA situations of today, like the, the, the volatile, the uncertain, the chaotic, the, like these ideas are all part of the challenge of doing work today in the knowledge era. It's not just, you know, COVID, or the current political unrest in a whole bunch of countries, uh, notably right now the United States. It's also just about the fact that in the knowledge era, we're in this always on society. We're constantly getting email. We're constantly getting phone calls. Now we have open plan offices. We came up with this idiotic idea. Now we have, so people are now just dropping in and that can cause a lot of distraction. And so how do we be able to focus? Part of it is that managers and leaders can create the space to focus take things off people's plates, help people prioritize, help create protected time or protected space, whether that's intellectual space or physical space, where the only priorities are the mutually agreed upon priorities. And this, by the way, is an important aspect of hypnosis that we're working with the agreed upon, the mutually agreed upon priorities. And that's really what hypnotists do. Like really, why in the world would I as a hypnotist go up to people and start doing stuff randomly? That just doesn't make sense. Not for me, not for anyone. Like, why would that happen? And, but I do have to point out, it really doesn't make much of an interesting drama if, uh, if, I, if I can't just randomly do it, right? Because otherwise, that, that's not very interesting. Never mind. Uh, we, we, we don't want to do that. Myth number two, hypnotized people are asleep or unconscious. While we do, uh, while we do uh, it is helpful for people to uh, focus when they're relaxed. But if you think about meditation, a lot of meditators, they do relax. It helps. It's not required. Uh, research by Barabash, uh, for example, does a lot in uh, something called active alert hypnosis. And, we, and they have actually demonstrated that they can hypnotize somebody while they are literally riding a bicycle. They, they did this on a stationary bike. They hypnotized somebody while they were riding a stationary bike. Uh, this has been repeated a whole lot of times. So you don't need to be relaxed or asleep. Um, I, have, I have also done uh, walking hypnosis, what I, what I call walking hypnosis. Hypnotism. We're, we're, we're going on a walk. And uh, while we're walking, I've hypnotized the person. I've, I've definitely done stuff like that. So they don't need to relax. Jen, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, several comments and questions we had early had to do with the difference between what's happening with meditation and what's happening with hypnosis. Can you kind of, before you move on, yeah. kind of address that question? So this gets really complicated really fast in large part because there are many, many different types of meditation. So... I'm going to make a gross overgeneralization 
and say that um, we can think of hypnosis as goal-directed guided meditation. Often the point of meditation, there is a, a personal goal, but it's not necessarily a behavior change or awareness of something. Awareness of something is where the overlap comes in and why I'm making a gross generalization, because sometimes we meditate for awareness, but we also use hypnosis for awareness. But often the difference between hypnosis and meditation is that hypnosis is often toward a behavioral goal, whereas meditation is more toward an awareness or it's more towards just the purpose of focusing with often um, a unitary concept, for instance, non-judgmentalism, compassion, any number of other things. And because there's so much variation on that, I, I do want to concede that it's a gross overgeneralization, but, but I, I think that the difference is uh, behavioral goal. Does that cover it, Jen? Yes, that was really, really helpful. Also, um, people, some of the people here are not native English speakers and you're speaking fast, which is um, normal for you. <laughs> But if we could uh, slow it down a little bit, I know you're excited, but slow it down a little bit um, and that will help our non-native English speakers um, understand what you're talking about just a little bit better. Would you believe that that is slowing it down? <laughs> yes. Uh, but, uh, I know a little bit better, but um, just to help everybody out, this is actually my normal talking speed. <laughs> um, so I actually was slowing it down even when I was uh, doing, even when I was doing the uh, presentation. I'll slow it down a little bit more. I know I have to slow it down when I present, and uh, ironically, it is the number one complaint for my students. Professor Davis talks too fast. Uh, very, very common complaint. I'll do my best here. All right. So if you think about it this way, let, let me point out just one of those biggest ironies of, you know, the, the idea that hypnotized people are asleep. Uh, I don't know about you, but most people can't do anything while they're asleep. Just, just let that sink in for a second. If I hypnotize somebody and they're asleep, they're asleep. They're not doing anything. They're asleep. They're all cold. That's the point. So, uh, you know, obviously that, that, that doesn't uh, help, but I got to put, so why do we, why, why does the media show that? Because it's a lot more interesting to the plot. If the, if the poor hapless hypnotized person isn't conscious of what they're doing now, now we can have them do all sorts of things that they don't know that they do. And oh my God, the dramatic big reveal when they find out what they did. Whoa, that's really what's going on here. That, that's the point of that. So wh what do we draw from this for humanistic management? One of them is, I, I hate to say this, but people too often think of employees as zombies. They're going through the day like sleepwalkers. And you know, I understand that people don't want insubordinate employees, but you know what? Zombie employees don't get anything done. Just like sleeping people don't actually act when they're hypnotized, zombie employees don't get anything done. You don't want your employee to be a zombie. That's part one. But part two, and of course, many of the experienced meditators in here know what I'm about to say, which is that just because it looks like you aren't doing anything doesn't mean you're actually doing nothing. And perhaps you might be just sitting and thinking and possibly meditating. And goodness knows, that's a good thing. And the research is abundantly clear. I, like that. Uh, I, I can go through citations all day of taking a moment to think at work, stepping out and uh, just having some incubation time, stepping away from your desk, taking a break, meditating, all very good things. So you know what? Maybe some, maybe some solo time when you're not doing anything, that might be a good thing. And you know, we do have this myth that hypnotized folks are under the control of the hypnotist. Well, let me unpack that one for you. So imagine that I've got a person who is wide awake. And my favorite example from this, uh, actually, uh, I, I stole this whole cloth uh, from the book slash movie, The Search for Bridie Murphy. It is a great example. Right now, how many of you, if we're, if we're just sitting in a room together, now, you know, in this public forum, and I, I have one of you come up, we're sitting down in front of everybody, and I ask you to take off your shoe and sock. Most of you are probably not really up for that idea. Now, the most amazing thing is that right after I hypnotize you, I, you know, you've said no. Everybody's heard you say no. They've witnessed you saying no. Now I hypnotize you. I tell you to take off your shoe and sock, and you totally do it. Now, what, what is everybody thinking? Everybody's thinking that this hypnotic procedure has now incited you to overcome that verbal no. But let's stop and think about this for a second. 
How many of you really have a problem with taking off your shoe and sock? Now, there are, by the way, religious groups that uh, do consider it immodest to show one's feet like that. So for those people, they're actually not even going to do it under hypnosis either, but that's that they're, they're a separate group and a, and a notable exception. But for most of us, we don't actually have a problem taking off our shoes and socks, even in front of other people. It's not so much that it's a problem. It's just that like, well, why would I do that? Nobody else is doing that. That's not exactly a, a standard protocol that we're all going to do. So because of that, you're generally going to say no if I ask you to do it. And you're also going to look at me like, that is a really weird suggestion. Yes, it is. That's the point. And this highlights what hypnosis actually gets people to do. It's that we can get people to do things that are, the way I explain it is odd, but not objectionable. And what happens is because we go through that procedure, right? I tell you to take off your shoe and sock and you're, you say no, then I hypnotize you, then you do it. You don't, like the people that are observing, don't stop and think about the fact that what I asked them to do was actually relatively innocuous. Asking you to take your shirt off is not going to work under either circumstance, but nobody thinks about it because I don't escalate it. I don't go for the stuff that's objectionable. I only go for the stuff that's odd. And by the way, stage hypnosis, that's also part of the trick with stage hypnosis. And then people go, well, what about the X-rated shows? Hold your horses, because I'll explain how those work later. Um, but that's really what's going on. You're not under the control of the hypnotist. You really do. But hypnosis does change how you respond to suggestion. But I also want to point out, and this, this is a big thing, is that hypnosis really is a consensual thing. But of course, the plot of anything would be pretty dull if hypnotized people had free will. That just ruins all the drama, right? And this is, and, and by the way, I do this, I do this with students and I actually challenge people to this. Let me, let me offer you a hypothetical here. And again, I'm not looking for answers, but just think about this through in your head. If I gave you the ability to actually control other people, what would you make them do? Now, everybody thinks this is a great idea. But take a moment, what would you do? And if you're like most people, what you stop and realize is nothing. You don't actually want this ability. Like we all think we want this ability. Like, wouldn't it be so cool? And then you stop and think about it. And it's like, uh, actually, no, it's not, it's not very cool at all. It's actually quite worthless. And for, for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is most of what we want from other people, we want authentically. Almost anything we want from other people, we want them authentically. And then people go, well, well, what about all the things that you could get? I'm going to point out that it's deviants that like to steal stuff or obtain things in an inauthentic way. They're deviants. They're not normal people. Normal people generally want things to be earned. They generally want to get things for real reasons. When somebody does something for them or gives something to them, they want it to happen because there's a genuine process going on. When it's not, these are, first of all, people we really don't want to be around. We don't like them. And we generally conceive of them as deviant, whether it's something simple or even something complicated. So the fact of the matter is we really don't want to control people. And, you know, we, we, we find this is a big problem in management, in fact. And, um, my, my dad actually had a really great comic hanging uh, on his wall in his office. And it's a manager freaking out. And the caption is, you know, the, the manager's voice going, oh God, you did exactly what I told you to do. And that's the thing we like, you know, for those of you who've read like the Amelia Bedelia books, this is a kid's book about a woman who takes every uh, request literally. And so, uh, for example, when she plays a game of baseball and she's instructed to steal home plate, she walks over, picks up the plate, and then takes it away from the field, uh, thus stealing it, <laughs> uh, not quite getting, you know, those non-literal things. And the problem is that often the hypnotized mind is a lot more literal. When, when we think about control, it's like, you know, if you, if you do, if people do exactly what you tell them to do, that's going to be a problem that, that actually leads to issues. And actually, for those who've read Atlas Shrugged, I'm going to spoil one line because there's a really great line in that. And uh, uh, two people talking and one of them says to the other that, um, I want you to think. And the man responds, how is your gun going to make me do that? No matter what level of force we have, 
We can force people to act. We can force people to move, so to speak, or at least we constrain their choices so that they will act or they will be killed. But the, funnily enough, the one thing we actually can't make people do is think or analogously emote. But we can't, you, no matter what you do, there is no amount of force you have that can make someone think. And in the knowledge era, we absolutely need the freedom to think and we need our employees and the people that we work with to have the freedom to think. And we must make sure that we're protecting that, that we're enhancing that, that we're encouraging that freedom. That, that rather than being controlling, on the contrary, we need to be promoting the freedom to think. And we need to begin by recognizing that that is the one thing we can't make people do. Uh, Janice, I unmute there. Did you have a question? I was actually just, well, I got, I'm choking on spittle, but I'm fine. <laughs> um, but I did want to kind of start moving the conversation into the application to business management. Mm -hmm. And, you know, okay, so we know what it's not, but let's talk about the more positive um, applications and why it's relevant. You started talking about, you know, the idea of management. You can't force people to do things. And I like where this is headed. So I'm just hoping we can move That's actually out exactly where I'm going. Perfect. So along those lines, the first thing to keep in mind is that people are only going to do knowledge work when they want to, because you can't force people to think. People are only going to do knowledge work when they want to. And because of that, the first thing that managers and leaders need to think about is that they need to encourage people. They need to empower people. They need to enable people with vision, with meaning. These are the things that get people to do things, not control and not force, because it doesn't really work that way except in drama. So now uh, there is one other myth that I do want to throw in here because it is kind of important. And like I said, I'm going to ruin this for folks. And that is how do stage shows work? So this is your last chance to get out of here if you still want to enjoy stage hypnosis. But otherwise, here we go. So let me explain how stage hypnosis works. Now, most of the time, the stage hypnotist is going to do a quick demo, um, have people in their seats doing a quick hypnotizability test. And then they invite a bunch of people on stage. Pay attention to each of the steps because this is really, really important. They invite a whole bunch of people on stage. So what happens is three types of people get up on stage. The first group are the enthusiastic people. I'm getting hypnotized. This is going to be so cool. The second group is the curious people. Okay, well, I say this is going to work. But all right, let's see what happens. And then there's the third group of people. They're the ones that are going, hee hee, I'm going to ruin the show. I'm going to totally mess this up. <laughs> right. And there, those are the three types of people that get up on stage. So I am now about to ruin the entire thing for you. We know how to identify which group you're in. Because what happens is after they get all get up on stage, the hypnotist goes around, does a bunch of things, hypnotizes a couple people. What you don't realize is all those people are in group one. They're the people that came up and want to do it. The hypnotist knows how to figure those people out. And so it's hypnotizing them to add to the drama and to keep you from getting bored while they're rooting out who's in group two and who's in group three that, and the people that they send down from the stage, they're all in groups two and three. They're the curious people who aren't really gonna be going with it and the people that were trying to ruin the show. And so what you're left with is a whole bunch of people that consented to what's gonna happen. And that's the key. And along those lines, there are a bunch of hidden rules in there. And like I said, the biggest thing that nobody realizes is that we have, we have tricks and techniques for identifying who's eager to do this, who's, who's just curious, and who wants to ruin the show. We know how to identify those folks. And there are also a whole bunch of other tricks um, that are used in the process of uh, stage hypnosis that Darren Brown is using. There are a whole bunch of psychological tricks that are in there. But with Darren Brown, there are two other things that you got to pay attention to. One of them is the role of the camera and the stage. This creates expectations. And when people are consenting to that, they're consenting to the expectations of the camera or the stage. With Darren Brown, uh, also for a lot of episodes, you don't know how many times he tried it off camera or with somebody else. You only get to see the successes, but you don't know what percentage of the time it works. Some of the stuff that Darren Brown does, <clears throat> excuse me, does have lower percentages that, of working. It does work, but only sometimes, but he can skip over all the failures and just go straight to the successes. And he can handpick the people that participate. So, so that's, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you because you said I could. Yeah. 
And um, start asking about the questions, you know, you know, has this been studied in organization in an organizational context? And um, does it play out or is it used in any situations that you know of in an organizational context? Hypnosis, not as much, <clears throat> but some of the lessons and keys from stage hypnosis do. And that's that's actually exactly where I'm about to go next. So thanks, Jen. So there are a couple of lessons that we learned from stage shows. And the first one is that in corporate cultures, there are a lot of tacit rules that we really could readily unpack, but we don't. We actually don't spend time looking under the hood. What are the expectations that are put upon us when we join a company, when we're brought in, when we're put in the spotlight in a meeting? What are the expectations that are laid upon us as managers? We need to think about what expectations we're tacitly putting on employees. As employees, we actually need to spend time thinking about what are we being told that we're expected to do or what are we being shown that we're expected to do. The role of expectation plays a major role, not just in hypnosis, but in management. And as employees, do we notice what expectations are being laid upon us and as managers, are we aware of the expectations that we're placing on employees? And especially a lot of managers are not aware of the tacit expectations that they give. And I know that this, you know, as, as, a, um, as a principal investigator, uh, this is something that I had to spend a lot of time learning is what expectations exist and what, what expectations do I have that I'm not articulating? And what expectations are my students you know, when I'm a professor or my research assistants when I'm a lab manager um, or my clients, when I'm a consultant, what are they, what expectations am I tacitly giving that they're internalizing? And are my expectations empowering or are they restrictive? Am I, am I widening their scope of action or am I constricting their scope of action? And similarly, when we're on the receiving end of expectations, are we being aware of the fact that the, that these expectations exist? Are we looking at um, how, whether our scopes are being broadened or whether our scopes are being constricted and part of managing up because you know everybody has implicit expectations that they don't unpack. Part of managing up is checking those realities. Hey boss, I feel like this expectation exists. Is that real? You know, Do you want that? Is that what you're expecting? And bosses are sometimes very surprised to realize what expectations their employees internalized that they may not have wanted their employees to have. So stage hypnosis actually is, is a great case study in the role of expectancy and in the role of also tacit consent. And we're often not mindful of what we're consenting to, but actually this is a major thing that we need to keep in mind when we engage in the hiring process, in the job crafting process, we're actually laying out the expectations and this in a very real sense is analogous to what real hypnotists do. So like for instance, if a client comes in to a hypnotist, the, one of the first thing that's gonna happen, we call it the pre-talk. Like what's going to happen? Like, why are you here? What do you want? What's, what are your expectations? And as hypnotists, we wanna find out what the client's expectation is. What do they want? What do they think is going to happen? And then we sit down with them and we actually craft the entire experience as much as possible start to finish. And we're creating expectancies. Now, stop and think about it. Every job should start that way too, right? Let's have a pre-talk, let's sit down. What is this job gonna be about? What do you expect at this job? What do you want from this job? Now, let me tell you as the employer, here is what I expect of the employee of this job. Here's what I need. Here's what we're going to do. And now let's sit down together and craft this employment experience step by step, what's going to happen? What are your expectations? What are my expectations? Um, what is our definition of success? What do you want? What do I want? How do we make sure that this all works well together? Um, are there any tacit assumptions we have? Probably not gonna be able to reveal them all right now. So what is going to be our process for giving each other feedback? And by the way, in hypnosis, there's a lot of feedback. And uh, this is a point I'm gonna return to later, but uh, Milton Erickson, who's considered the grandfather of modern hypnosis, and for those who have ever heard of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, uh, don't wanna get into the validity of that or lack thereof right now, um, some and some, 
But all that comes from studying Erickson's techniques. And one of the things that Erickson said as, a, as one of the world's greatest hypnotists, one of the best in history, is he said, my clients show me what they need me to do. And people often are very shocked at this, at this very important statement. And it's a very simple one, but it's the realization that Erickson, despite being this world-class expert, he doesn't tell them, they tell him. When the clients come to me, they tell me what I need to do. And then I do it, right? And funnily enough, a lot of the most empowering managers, they let their employees tell them how to do good management. They let their employees tell them, how do you need me to be a good manager for you? And they encourage that. And it's hard. That's not, that's not easy to do. But that training that we get as hypnotists is actually very good training for being a manager also. But you need to learn to make the, trans, the, to make the transfer. And you know, it's, it's a challenge. Even when you know what you're doing, it's a challenge. And even when you're good at this, it's a challenge because people come in with hidden expectations. And we have to be aware of that. And part of what we need to do both as hypnotists and as participants is to help facilitate and the creation of that feedback loop from the very beginning. Make a feedback loop so that we can tell each other, this works, this doesn't. I feel like this is valuable to me. This is not valuable to me. I see you responding this way. I'm not sure that's a good thing. Um, I am responding this way. That's actually a good thing. Like creating those conversations and like creating an open dialogue dynamic, even though it's not quite equal in power or equal in facility, um, it's recognizing that the role of the hypnotist is to enable and empower. And that's, that's a point I'm going to come back to in a minute, but something to hold in mind. And because of that, we need to make sure that people are not doing things mindlessly, right? There's this myth that uh, hypnotized people don't remember stuff afterwards. Again, that's just for drama. If people don't remember stuff afterwards, that's usually because um, there, there's a good therapeutic reason for that. And like hypnoamnesia is usually for that. So what is the other kind of hypnoamnesia? Right, people, people wake up from hypnosis, they don't remember what they did. I got news for you. When most people come home, right, they take off their coats, they take off their shoes, but they don't really remember doing it. What they remember is the fact that they did. Why? Because they're doing it mindlessly. When we do things mindlessly and we're not paying attention, we don't quite really remember what we did. We could. And if we really spend time thinking about it, we could remember it, but we usually don't. And this has, a, an, again, an important lesson for work also. If we want to be doing good knowledge work, we shouldn't be doing it mindlessly. And again, as managers, as leaders, we need to make sure that our employees are not working mindlessly, rather that they are working mindfully. And as a matter of fact, um, some of the things that hypnotists do is they encourage people to be mindful of something. I, I feel like, you know, uh, quoting the Jedi masters, be mindful of your thoughts, be mindful of your thoughts. And as hypnotists, we're doing that also to uh, with participants and with clients. Be mindful of your thoughts. Know what you're thinking. Jen, jump in here. Okay, so someone asked, and I think it's it's relevant at this point. Uh, could someone be hypnotized, for instance, to not eat sweets? Um, I mean, could you help them with that? So th those are two different things. So the first one is, um, can we? One of the best things, one of the best things about hypnosis is that um, whatever rules of consent we're able to create, we can use those. So can I do that? Sure. Is that the best idea? Probably not. Uh, the idea of using hypnosis to create explicit blocks in people, listen, there's a reason why, why people sometimes like sweets. There's a value to that. And there really is value in recognizing the natural processes of people. I got to tell you, about uh, 20, 20 some odd years ago, I used to answer questions on hypnosis forms. And this is one of those times when, for example, uh, being a homosexual was less accepted uh, than it is today. And a question I got a lot of the time is, can you hypnotize me to no longer be a homosexual? And my answer to that is always no. <laughs> no, you can't do that. But what we can do with hypnosis is help you accept yourself as a homosexual and help you to deal with the social situations that you encounter as a homosexual, both the positive and the negative, and we can help you deal with that. But frankly, like being homosexual is not a choice. It's not a behavioral choice. It's not a lifestyle choice. Uh, this one is biological. And so we can help you with that, but that's all we can do. We can help you 
uh, channel it. We can help you deal with it. Um, we can help you handle the situation, but we can't change it. And it's not a good idea to change it. And for all those natural processes that we have, it's not a good idea to just hit a button on it. Because whatever it is we have, we have it for a reason. And so I get this question also with habit control. You don't want to just go to a hypnotist to push a button and stop a habit. We develop habits for a reason. That's as true at work as it is at home, in life, in almost anything else. We've got a habit for a reason. Don't touch that habit till you understand the reason. And that would be that would be my response to anybody that says, can you hypnotize me to X? My answer to that is always, why do you do X? We need to understand why you do X before we can say that it is even a good idea for you to stop doing X. Now we can change the parameters of X, we can reduce X. And I see, you know, for example, a question about behavior cues. Sure, um, although I also wanna point out that Jen is uh, very much an expert on behavior cues. So this is, uh, she is also a very good person to talk to you about this stuff. But um, when it comes to behavior cues, I'm just gonna give the brief one. And uh, I actually may even defer to Jen for some of these things. Cause uh, again, this is, this, that definitely is her wheelhouse. But um, when it comes to behavior cues, um, part of what we can do as hypnotists is set those up. But again, we want to do it very, very carefully. We want to make sure that we're setting up those behavioral cues that to make sure that they fit into your life. And they're going to be part of a larger vision for an updated life that you want. And if you stop and think about it, sometimes even little behavior changes can make a significant impact in your life. And as hypnotists, we must be mindful of that. And we want you to be mindful of that. So uh, Jen, I hope that covers the question. I think so. And I, I think too, that you got into the next question, which was the behavioral cues um, that differentiate people who want to engage, which just are, are curious, um, you know, and I think that, like you said, is, is a deeper question. I'd like to come back to it and instead go to the next question, okay. which is there a connection between illusion and manipulation and are there dangerous or unethical connections to the to hypnosis and its correlation obviously as we've been talking about to best management practices like what have we learned about what's ethical and unethical in hypnosis as it relates to management is and the issue of illusion and manipulation because we do know um that does happen <laughs> in the workplace <laughs> Uh, it, believe it or not, Jen, it happens a lot more in the workplace than it does in hypnosis. Manipulating people with hypnosis is actually rather hard to do. Um, it's, it's very hard to do. But um, I, I want to, I'm going to piss off a whole lot of people with this. So hold on to your hats. Let me tell you what the difference is between motivation and manipulation. Let's say that there's something that you're a little bit leery about doing. You come to me, you mention this, and somehow I get you to do it. You end up doing it. Now, if you're happy about that outcome, you call me a motivator. If you're unhappy about that outcome, you call me a manipulator. But I do want to point out that I did the same thing. So what's interesting about this is that we often don't think about how much we do or don't want the outcome. And we also don't think about how much the point of motivators or manipulators is that we're getting somebody over the hump. Now, if you're trying to get somebody over the hump because of your own purposes and you're the one benefiting from it, that's, that's a different thing. But you have to keep in mind that when it comes to the difference between motivation and manipulation, we need to understand what, the, what both people in this situation want and most importantly, why they want it. So when everybody's got good intentions and everybody's got good outcomes and one person helps another get over the barrier, that's definitely a motivation. Um, when there's good intentions or not good intentions and uh, good or bad outcomes, when, when, it, when those don't match, when the intentions and the outcomes for, uh, I mean, remember, we've got the intentions and outcomes of the person who helps the other get over the hump and the intentions and outcomes of the person that gets over the hump. Whenever there's a mismatch, we start talking about manipulation. That's not always accurate though, because people sometimes help people get over humps with good intentions, wanting good outcomes, but it turns out bad. And also not everything is directly guaranteed. When, when we try and help somebody past a block and something happens that could lead to bad outcomes anyway, for unforeseen reasons. 
we often don't unpack these things and we very quickly jump to manipulation, motivation, uh, or you know something along those lines. We do that way the hell too fast. So this is definitely one message I wanna tell people is before you make that judgment, slow the hell down. Look at the motivations of all the people involved. Look at the outcomes desired by all people involved. Look at the blocks. Look at the context. There's going to be a lot in the context that is not visible, not even visible to the two people. And the, and the quick judgments on this lead to a hell of a lot of bad stuff. So it's one of the reasons why I'm so emphatic about this, because a lot of bad things, people jump to the conclusion of like, oh, they're gaslighting. Oh, they're being controlling. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not. So, and, and the, the speed with which we jump to that without knowing the information of the context is a problem. And the reason why I say that is because we sometimes assume that bosses are bad or that leaders are bad without realizing what's really going on there. And we often, because of power imbalances, we tend to want to blame the people in power because we want to hold them responsible. And there's, there is some good logic to saying that to whom much is given, from them much is, uh, much is expected. Totally cool, totally true. But we often don't look at the context in which people in power have to make judgments. I'll give you a simple example. And again, I don't want to get political here, but one thing I do want to say, which is related to politics, and this is true of any president I want to point out. As citizens, we often question some of the moves that our leaders make. But let me give you one very simple piece of information that we don't have, and that is their morning security briefing. We have no idea what is written in that briefing, and we don't have the clearance to hear it, to, to have that information. So as much as we like to judge our politicians, we definitely don't know the context in which they make decisions or in which they operate. And it's similar for managers and leaders. We don't know what pressures they're getting from above them or from outer context or what's going on in their lives. And we assume that because they've gotten to such levels that they can handle it. They may be responsible, but they also have context that we don't know and they may not share that with us. So we have to be very careful as, as more junior people, we have to be careful about how quick we judge more senior people. They know more, they have more experience. They may be trying to do things that they believe are gonna be helpful. And sometimes they're wrong. And that's, can, I, yeah. can I jump in? Because yeah. it's kind of, I, I'm loving this, but the next, where it's leading me is the, the note I made just a little bit ago is, um, and it ties into Gerard's question too, is the, the words that came up for me is, okay, so self-defense, if people are using motivation for us in, um, a manipulative, like for their own purposes, as opposed to a mutually consensual agreed upon thing. And that does happen with abusive people. Is there a way to think through and use this knowledge to help us with self-defense from these things and to stand our ground and be more aware of our responses to them? And also I think uh, Gerard, it, this ties into Gerard's idea of reinforcing biases or you know, the, the converse of that, which is to dispel biases, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and it, it ties into our assumptions about the people that we feel may be wronging us in some way. So if you, I know that was a lot to unpack, but if you can try. Yeah. That yeah. Would be good. All right. So that, that is a lot to unpack. So um, I've gotten the, the question about how do we engage in self-defense against abusive people? That gets really complicated really fast. I'm going to provide a couple of basic tips, but I want to be very clear that these tips are not always going to work. They depend on context. So the first thing is um, being able to, to uncover the tacit assumptions. What am I consenting to? And more importantly, and this is the number one piece of self-defense, so I really want everybody to listen because this is a big one. The number one form of self-defense that we have is, do I trust this information source? step back and assess the validity of the information source you're getting. How do I trust this information source? Why do I trust this information source? What are my reasons for trusting? What are my reasons for distrusting? Because very often we just don't think about it. 
And that is our number one thing because, um, and, and by the way, the, the, the key to uncovering a lot of tacit assumptions, this is the biggest uh, step that we can take. Now, it doesn't always work. And I want to be clear about that because there are, con there are contextual things and people, people who want to be manipulative or abusive know that you're going to do that. So they'll do things to combat that. Uh, again, I don't have time to get into all that now. But that is your number one self-defense. It is, it is the best weapon in your arsenal is re-evaluate, step back and objectively evaluate the validity of the source. Do I trust, do I trust what this person is saying? Why, why not? And similarly, it's why do I, why do I want? And we also have to uh, unpack our own desires. Why do I want to trust this source? And when it comes to biases, often the answer is expediency. It is expedient for me to trust this source, right? The whole debate about fake news and I don't want to get into all the politics of that, but I just do want to point out that reading the news is an expedient way of getting information, right? We don't have time to do all the homework on this. We don't have time to unpack all this stuff. So we just want somebody to give it to us in a clean, neat little package. And we don't question it. We don't have time. But if we really do care about something or this is an issue that's really near and dear to our hearts, we must unpack, we must question. And we have to question everything. And we have to be willing, and this is the hard thing to do. We have to be willing to question our motivations, our reasons. And often, I hate to say this, but we're gonna discover some ugly truths about ourselves also. We're gonna discover that we don't care about something as much as we thought we did. We're going to discover that there's an emptiness that we're using somebody else to fill or that we're using some activity to fill, or we're going to discover that we fear being inadequate. There's a whole lot of things and that's what makes this hard and what makes people shut down this process when they start it. And that's the value of also the second piece of self-defense is get some support, but be careful about choosing your support because funnily enough, sometimes in attempt to be supportive, we make things worse. And we've seen this a lot, actually, in a number of abusive situations that aren't actually abusive. But when, but when the supporter reads this, reads into this as abuse, they'll actually help promote the abuse narrative when, in fact, there's actually just a lot of miscommunication or unpack of expectations and so on. There's a lot of other things that can happen. And we, we've seen this documented, that sometimes, that sometimes getting the wrong supporter can actually turn a bad situation into an evil situation because the supporter misinterprets what's going on. So as supporters, we need to, when we're helping people, we need to be entirely non-judgmental. That's damned hard because we bring our own biases. We gotta be non-judgmental. So step one, analyze your sources, check your realities, analyze your reasons for trusting the sources. And step two is get non-judgmental support. This is a big one. So, and uh, funnily enough, uh, cats are, uh, somebody mentioned that uh, cats are uh, manipulative animals. Yes, they are. So are dogs. But the thing is, once again, we want them to manipulate us. And because we want them to be cute and adorable. And, uh, you know, again, there's they're sort of a uh, oddly symbiotic uh, relationship there. So, so pets, are, pets are a special case. Oh, my goodness. My cat has completely trained me. She will not eat out of her dish unless I jiggle it for it, even when there's food there. And I dutifully go and jiggle her dish. Anyways, okay, so we have about five minutes left. Um, and this has been fascinating. And I really want to thank you for taking the time because this is such a weird, I don't want to, weird is such a bad word, but it's such an interesting topic that most of us don't know anything about. And what we've heard about, like you said, is, is not relevant, but it, gosh, you know, the lessons from it, you're right, are absolutely relevant to management and specifically to humanistic management because of the consent issue. Mm -hmm. So um, I want you to spend a little time thinking like if you had to give managers who are well-intentioned um, and humanistic as everybody here is, two pieces of advice on what they should, what you'd like them to think about doing differently in their work, what would those two things be? So if I can step back from that question for a second, and just say a couple things before I answer it, because uh, that is going to lead up to uh, you know my big uh, my big take home on this. So I've been leading up to something really really big, um, and, and that is that is my reward for everybody who stays to the end. Um, so this is the big reveal. 
The transitive verb hypnotize is meaningless. I'm gonna put that a little bit differently. When I explain hypnosis to people, whenever I teach it, whenever I talk about it, this is rule number one, and this is an inviolable rule. All hypnosis is self-hypnosis. There is no such thing as hypnotizing other people. We don't hypnotize other people. When people, when I say, when I say that I'm hypnotizing other people, that is a convenience. That is a convenient word that I use for what actually saying I am helping somebody hypnotize themselves. I can't hypnotize you. I can help you do something that you want to do. I can show you why it's a good idea. I can show you how to get there. I can, I am, I am trained at navigating minds and navigating thought processes. And I will help you navigate yours. But you're doing the navigating, you're doing the mapping, you're doing the driving, you're starting the car, you're cranking the engine, you're hitting the gas, you're hitting the brakes, you're doing everything. We do this ourselves. And the role and goal of a hypnotist is to enable and empower people to have better control. So it is one of those biggest ironies that we think that hypnotists exist to control people. It's the exact opposite. Our goal as hypnotists is to guide and empower people into controlling themselves more effectively, using their abilities more effectively, using their power more effectively. That is what we do. By the way, managers, leaders, that's what they're supposed to do too. And that's my big take home. Managers, leaders, recognize that your employees work only when they want to work, how they want to work, and their best work is only going to come that way. Your role and goal as a leader and a manager is to enable and empower your employees to bring their uniqueness into their jobs and maximize their harnessing of that power, that experience, that maturity, that intelligence, that wisdom, that uniqueness into their work to create something that nobody else can create in a purposeful and meaningful way. Thank you all. That was powerful. I couldn't type <laughs> fast enough. <laughs> I was like, that's what it took me a little bit. I'm like, oh, oh. okay. <laughs> so I wanna thank you again um, for doing this and for enlightening us and to remind people that this has been um, the International Humanistic Management Emotional Intelligence Subgroup meeting, our first official public meeting. Um, and we're hoping to do this more and bring in other experts to have more conversations along these lines. Uh, join us at humanisticmanagement.international uh, to learn more.